The Widow's Tale The year is 1990. In a street cafe in Paris, Charlotte is waiting for her friend Colette. Café, madame? Uh, um, not until my friend's here. She's late. I Thank hope Thank you, nothing. Mario. Oh, where is she? Oh, Colette! Colette! Are you all right? Oh, nice of you to ask. Now, can you please help? What on earth is all that for? You're expecting the army to visit for the weekend? Just family. As you keep reminding me, I have no friends. Ah, so it's young Jean Bernard, Gabrielle and the kids. Judging by those provisions, they're staying for the year. No, Charlotte, not this time. What is it, darling? Something's bothering you. We've met at this cafe every Thursday for the last 40 years. 32! Well, a long time. And I know it and something's wrong. Tell me, what's happening this weekend that's bothering you? Oh, I'm sorry. It's all a bit too much. Let, let's just have coffee and chat about your exotic love life as usual. Mario, two coffees please and our usual treats. Yeah, just today I'd like to hear about you. Every week you want to hear about my exotic love life as you call it. Mainly because nothing much ever happens in your life. Thank you. Well it's true. Yeah, now something obviously is happening in your life. It's bothering you. So, talk about it. I'd rather not. It's private. It's embarrassing. It's... Look, Colette, I've poured my heart out to you and it's always helped me. And you know that whatever's said at this table goes no further. What is this? Some kind of confessional? Well, that's what you need to enable you to see things clearly. And what is it that's bothering you? Purge my soul before I die. Is that it? If that's what you need, fine. Perhaps you're right. Perhaps that's exactly what I need. So, what is it? Young John Bernard is coming to stay, alone. And I'm not really sure for how long. When one of my sons comes to visit me alone, there's only one of two reasons. One, to borrow money. Or two, for romantic advice. I should think number one, highly unlikely, with him being one of the top legal brains in Paris. I also think too unlikely, as you've been the grieving widow for the past 50 years. Ah, uh, good um, God, that's it, isn't it? He's coming to you for matrimonial advice. Good gracious. Is Gabrielle having an affair? No, quite the opposite. You mean young Jean Bernard's having an affair? Yes, well, he's considering leaving Gabrielle and he wants to talk it through with me. Oh, for goodness sake, Colette. This is a male ego thing. If he fell in love and was really serious about running off with what's-her-name, well, he'd have done it. He wouldn't come to his widowed mother for advice. He's not going to leave Gabrielle. Just wants people to know that he's still got it at middle age. He's not middle-aged. Anyway, why would he boast to me about his conquest? He's got plenty of friends and colleagues. Colleagues, Colette. That's the problem. You're the one person he knows who'll keep it completely to yourself. His marriage is safe, don't worry. Oh, maybe you're right. But it's, it's more than that. This business has brought back so many memories of my past life. Your past? What have you to concern yourself with? The successful female lawyer? The widow of a famous wartime resistance leader? You've grieved for Jean Bernard Senior all your life. Never even looked at another man. What do you know of illicit love affairs? Mm, perhaps you're right. You know I am. Well, no, you... I don't mean about that. It's what you said earlier about purging my soul and confessing my sins before I die. Oh, don't, darling. But if it helps, you know I'll listen, not judge, and help if I can. You know my father purchased my cottage in Foray before the war? You told me he planned to move there when he retired to be near his friend Louis. They were at university together and both attained their law degrees in the same year. 
After graduation, my father joined the family practice in Paris, and Louis went back to Foray to start his own local law firm. Well, that much I knew. And they remained firm friends until your father's untimely death. What I don't think I've ever told you was the letter I received from my father when I graduated in 1938. Well, I know your parents didn't attend your graduation ceremony. No. Well, that, that was just them. Anyway, the letter told me not to go home, but to go straight to the cottage in Foray. My father wrote that he had shut everything down in Paris, whatever that meant, and they would join me in a few weeks. Mm, but they never made it. The car accident. Well, you told me about that, and your doubts that it really was an accident. My father handled a number of very high-profile cases, some involving politicians and business leaders. His decision to suddenly leave Paris and effectively lay low in the country may have been driven by concern about what was happening in Germany, what he knew about his clients, or maybe even scandals he himself was tied up in. In any case, he thought it was time to go. I believed others had different ideas. You told me how you'd hardly moved in when the police came to you and told you about the tragic car accident and that both your parents had died instantly. The whole thing just didn't ring true. The local police just seemed so nervous when they told me. Brake failure, the car just rolled completely off the road. That was no accident. But to try and prove it would almost certainly have been worse for me. So that's how you got started in Foray, working for Louis and his son. Yes. Oh, we were so happy in those early days. This may sound cruel, but I felt for once that I had a real family. Village life was so serene, the people a joy to deal with, and the cases so simple. Wills, the odd land dispute and property transaction. Was it then that Louis suggested that you and his son Jean Bernard take control of the business? Not quite like that. Jean Bernard and I, after working together for just over a year, announced our plans to marry. Louis was delighted, decided to retire, and that's how we ended up running the show. Everything was wonderful. Even Nazi occupation in 1940 didn't really affect our little town. Provided the mayor stuck to local politics and didn't rock the boat, everything carried on much as it was. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Until the Nazis took over the chateau. Even that didn't really change anything. I think the old man was pleased to leave the chateau. And as they were using it as a military hospital, it didn't really impact on our local life. Well, until Louis was shot. Yes. The attraction of the chateau as a hospital for high-ranking German officers was its proximity to Paris. The fact that it was in a forest, making it difficult to spot from the air and the railway passing by. They made some sort of station or halt at the chateau so that they could move the injured with the minimum of fuss. Mm -hmm. How did Louis get shot? Wrong place, wrong time. Apparently, late one night, he was asked to drive the doctor into the forest where a member of the resistance had received a bad gunshot wound. At that time, I didn't even know there was a resistance. But it seemed that the railway line was a target. Louis was to drive as close as the road allowed and dropped the doctor off. Louis, alone in the car, stepped out for a cigarette and was shot, presumably by Germans after the resistance. When the doctor returned, Louis was already dead. Why didn't the doctor use his own car? Small town, old doctor with bike, no car. Oh, Colette, how awful it must have been to receive such news. Well, I was obviously in shock and terribly upset, but Jean Bernard was so angry. I'd never seen him like that. He was so mad with rage. I mean, he had to be physically restrained. He was all for going down to the chateau with a shotgun and shooting every German in sight. He was told repeatedly that his father would not have been killed by anyone at the chateau. And in any case, if he wanted to get even, he needed to get clever 
and not to march down to a German stronghold. Holding a loaded rifle was certainly not that. There and then they, there and then they invited him to join their resistance movement. And from that point on, our lives changed forever. Oh, you poor thing. You've had more than your fair share of tragedy. Then you lost Jean Bernard. But he did die hero, leave you with a wonderful son, young Jean Bernard. I'm, I'm afraid there's more to tell. Go on. From that point on, Jean Bernard became totally obsessed with the resistance. I, I hardly saw him. I was running the business alone. He'd disappear for a week at a time. He would never tell me anything as he said it was too dangerous. He had no married life. I'd see him occasionally for meals or when I left for work, I'd find him sleeping on the sofa. I was finding it almost impossible to cope with. The only thing that kept me sane was my work. Apart from that, there was nothing. I avoided talking to anyone as I couldn't say anything. Neither could they. I took to taking my lunch at the local cafe. I needed to get out, but to avoid casual conversation, I would take work with me. I'd sit at a table and spread my papers out so no one else could sit with me. I didn't have any work, I just spread them out anyway. One hot July Monday, I was sitting at an outside table, papers spread out as usual, when I became aware of a tall, good-looking, bespectacled young man standing next to me with a coffee in one hand and a plate of pastries in the other. All of a sudden, I longed to talk to someone who didn't know me and didn't know Jean Bernard. I'm sorry to bother you, madame, but may I just sit? The hot weather's brought everyone out and all the other tables are occupied. Uh, no, please. I'm sorry, do sit. My name is Colette Aubert. Um, I'm a local lawyer, just taking a short break for lunch. A lawyer? That sounds exciting. Not really. More sort of, whose pig is that? That's my Hector, you fenced off. Mm. <laughs> you look like a businessman. I assume you're down from Paris to see our mayor? Oh, no, no. My name is uh, Johan Bruckner. I'm a surgeon working at your beautiful chateau. Oh. I'm sorry, I should have said. I'll leave. No, please. Finish your lunch. I was just surprised. Your French is perfect, with no accent I can detect, and you just look very nice. Oh, I didn't, um... I spent time as a junior doctor in Paris before the war, but let me please reassure you, I'm not a soldier. I don't kill anyone. My job is to save lives. I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm a pacifist. I hate war. Fortunately, I don't have to fight and take lives. All I have to do is what I'm very good at. Saving lives, no matter what religion or nationality. Oh, are you the doctor that saved our young farm boy when he was thrown off his horse? Uh, he didn't need saving. All I did was splint a broken arm. Do you get in trouble for helping the villagers? <laughs> no, not at all. Look, I'm sorry to have embarrassed you, but it's just so refreshing to talk to an intelligent lady with local knowledge. <laughs> I must go. Will you come here again? I mean, um, will I see... I'm sorry. Yes, I will enjoy my lunch here again, if work permits. And I hope we may meet again to talk about pigs, hectares and farm boys without you thinking of me as the enemy. I am just a doctor. Oh dear. Don't imagine Jean Bernard would be happy with you chatting to the enemy. Well, that's the first thing that occurred to me. I also suspected that he would already know you can't hide anything in a small town. So I went straight home. There was a chance he would be there. He sometimes was in the afternoons. And was he? You're home for once. I think you knew that. Look, I have to tell you something. I know you've been fraternising with a Nazi. Not deliberately. I know. And it's not a problem. Bruckner is not dangerous. In fact, quite the opposite. 
He's probably more of a risk for them than us. So you don't mind that I talk to him? Not at all. You know nothing of interest you can tell him, but on the contrary, he may know lots that would interest me. So keep talking to him when you can. Make him feel relaxed and feel comfortable, but most importantly, listen. You want me to be your spy? In a word, yes. He seems an honest, genuine man who only wants peace. I can't believe he knows anything of interest, and if he does, I'm sure he wouldn't share it. Nevertheless, keep talking to him. Just chatter. You'd be amazed at what slips out. And did you see him again? Oh, yes. We meet again. I haven't seen you here for the past few days. No, busy. Lots of sick soldiers. I'm sorry, I mustn't pry. No, must die, but tell me. Any interesting pig or land dispute? <laughs> <laughs> and we talked and we laughed and soon we were meeting almost every lunch hour. You're here lots these days, Johan. Not so many sick soldiers. All right, Colette, I'll, I'll be totally honest with you. I've been encouraged to keep meeting you. My superiors believe you may know something of the insurgent movement around here. I can honestly no, say... Please hear me out. I'm sure your villagers are happy with you talking to me. It's quite funny, really. Both sides think we can glean information useful to their particular cause. When in reality, neither of us know anything of interest and really only want to talk about our simple lives and our peaceful future. Our future? Oh, I'm sorry, that sounded a little... Uh... Don't apologise. It sounded... Beautiful. Well, well, Colette, you were flirting. Look, Charlotte, my life was empty. Since Louis died, everything had changed. Jean Bernard expected me to run the business, run the home, run his life while he played soldiers in the woods. Oh, come on, Colette. He was a hero of the resistance, risking his life for his country. Perhaps I'd no way. You're not getting away with that. Oh, sorry. Today was to help you, not entertain me. Maybe both. Do you have a cigarette? What? You haven't smoked in ten years. Twelve. Oh, well, I suppose it... We meet here every day now. Where is this world and our lives going? Will this dreadful war ever end? It's lovely. It's heartbreaking. It's nerve-wracking. Oh, Colette, I know you're a respectable married businesswoman and I'm the enemy. But if only things were different. I'm going to say something now, Johan, and please don't interrupt. If you stop me now, I'll never be able to say it again. I'll be alone this evening. You know, my cottage. Come to my home at eight this evening. It will be dark by then. Come to the back, through the woods, knock softly on the back door and we can have dinner together, alone, and talk without fear of staring or interruption. There, I've said it. I'll be there. Oh, Colette. Yes, and I didn't feel guilty. I just felt wonderful for the first time in months. It was as if my real life was just beginning. Hello, Colette. Something smells wonderful. What? Did I want to show you something. But this is your bedroom. The candles, the perfume. In this room, you can be anyone you want to be. Say anything you want to say and do anything you want to do. You said that? Johan didn't leave until six the next morning, the same time as I threw the burnt dinner away. It was the most beautiful night of my life. But... Only an hour later, I, I was awoken by a knock at the door. I was instantly filled with fear and anticipation before I even knew who it was. 
The only thing I knew for sure was that it wouldn't be good. It was Pierre, one of Jean Bernard's resistance colleagues. He told me through tears, his and mine, that Jean Bernard had boarded a German train while being riddled with bullet and knife wounds. Under constant attack, he had grappled and killed some high-ranking Nazi before dying himself. Oh, that was the... I don't, I don't know, and, and I don't care who it was he killed. Oh, I only know I felt such guilt and pain and self-hate that I just... I fell to the ground. The villagers interpreted my show of mixed emotions as grief, treated me as the wife of a great hero and couldn't do enough for me. Oh, Colette, I had no idea. Did you ever see Johan again? I didn't go near the cafe for days. At the back of my mind, I, I couldn't dismiss the thought that Johan may have let slip that Jean Bernard would be out all night and somehow bore some responsibility for his death. After about a week, I went back to the office thinking that the distraction would somehow help. The post was neatly stacked on my desk. Among the condolences, bills, payments and queries was an envelope bearing the single word Colette. I somehow knew it was German but I also knew it wasn't from Johan. I opened it immediately and a handwritten letter simply said, I am a colleague of Johan. I am sorry to say that upon return to the chateau at 06.30 a week ago, he was mistaken for an intruder and shot. He died shortly after. He had enough time to beg me to let you know, and I was to tell you that he loved you. <laughs> Please destroy this letter. Stopped weeping for the next two weeks. Oh, my poor darling. <sighs> Sometime later, it was obvious that I was pregnant. The villagers were delighted. Jean Bernard's legacy. A brave soldier has fathered a brave son who must be named Jean Bernard in his honour. Oh, at that moment... I hoped it would be a girl. But no, nine months later, the villagers were rewarded with Jean Bernard's legacy, a son who had to be named in his father's honor. Does young Jean Bernard know any of this? No, and he never will. I will never speak of this or mention it again, and neither will you. I think I need to go. I'll see you here next week, as usual. Oh, I'll just get the bill, because it's, it's my turn to pay. Uh, no, Colette. You go if you need to. I'll get the bill. Today, you have paid enough. <laughs>